cool. Lots of people. Fun. Yes, this will be fun. through it, so... You guys want to pray with us? He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Priest like he is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Come and worship with us.
morning, Priest Lake. Happy Easter. Welcome to all of our visitors. There's a lot of people in the house this morning. So glad you're here. Obviously, it's so good to see some of the Burgesses here. I don't know how many of y'all are here, but good to see you guys. There's never, uh, you never have too many Burgesses. That's right. I, you know, I was learning something new from Wade this morning. We, we call them Burgie. There's, there's Burgie. There's a, he said, I saw a Burgie. I said, what's that? It's, it's the gift of the bird job. That's right. All right, guys, we're going to be um, reading some scripture together. If you'll read the highlighted portions, there is a good amount of reading this morning. So if you'll just uh, listen, uh, well, that's, that's good, <laughs> I guess. If you'll just uh, listen and, and take it all in. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Amen. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in, in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and, and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. She said. I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him. And cried out in Aramaic. And if you guys will say this. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go, go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to the, my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Let us worship the Lord this morning. Yes. Amen. Though in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, Death cannot keep his 
pray Jesus my Savior He But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. An empty tomb. An angel said, why look for him among the dead? Remember his words in Galilee, he is risen in me. And as he talked, their hearts were fed, but not until he broke the bread.
Last year at this time was a very difficult time for Connie and I and our family and for you. Nathan had been dead for just a short period of time. On Easter Sunday, we worshiped in the parking lot because of COVID. It was a Sunday when Connie felt like she wanted to sit on the front porch and listen to the worship and she could hear you guys all the way over, two doors down. And I just walked among the family of God in the parking lot and just wept. I didn't weep as one not having hope. I wept as one having hope who had been just received a sucker punch below the belt. And so I'm here, and Connie, I just asked her permission. We are standing before you as a testimony that the resurrection is true. Amen. Sometimes we worship and we think only in those borderline times do we feel our faith in the middle of the storm. The storm's here all the time, brothers. You're mortal. You will pass away unless Jesus appears again. And all that you love will return to dust. But we are proclaiming that that dust will come to life again because of Jesus Christ. Not because of anything that we have done. We hold on to this life and hope and goodness. Not because of our goodness or not because we've had a lucky run of things. That luck runs out. But Jesus does not. Don't coast through this life hoping that you will not experience difficult days. They will come your way. But we face the difficult days. I'm looking at Kathy back there. We face the difficult days in the full view of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Your sin and failure is not the last word. Amen. Nor your mortal body the last word. Jesus is the last word. Live in between the borderlines like you believe it. This is an edification to you and also a statement of faith. We have persevered, yes. Connie and I and Hope and Noah and everyone in here, not because of anything other than the grace of God. Now persevere in the grace of God. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within His presence I speak Jesus Alright, uh, I'm going to put several of us on the spot as we sing this song of blessing and speaking the name of Jesus over the body, I'm going to ask elders and your wives, just spread out around the periphery of the congregation and lift your hands over the body and blessing as we sing this. So a couple of you can come up front, go to the sides, go to the back. But let's sing this and bless the name of Jesus as we worship. Amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break Jesus. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom Jesus. I speak Jesus. Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing your name is life, Jesus. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire, Jesus. Jesus. I just wanna speak the name of Jesus. Yeah. 
Good morning. Good morning, Christopher. Oh, it is good. Good to be here. I haven't cried like this in a while. <laughs> So why do we celebrate Easter? Why do we come today? One reason is to recognize, to recognize what he's done. And I think oftentimes what he's done is bigger than we can really get our minds around. We're like, okay, you did everything. You laid down your life, you died, you rose. But it's more than we can get a hold of and doesn't relate sometimes to our daily lives. But I've got something right now that relates. We're working on an adoption. We, a few weeks ago, um, were matched with a child and we know his name now. His name's James. And we look forward to going in November, hopefully, and going to bring him home. Yeah. But that's a lot, a lot smaller thing than what God has done for us. A lot smaller thing. It reminded me of in Matthew. It says, which, which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks we'll fit for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? This is a good gift we're going to be able to give James. It's not even close. <laughs> it's not even close, guys. It's hard to do an adoption. It's expensive. We've got a lot of help. You guys have helped. We've other people with means have helped. My job's going to help. We're not going to pay the whole cost going forward. We're going to have family here to support us. Jesus didn't have that. He paid it all alone. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a, there'll be a lot of challenges to walk through. I don't think he's going to murder us. Jesus knew that we were. I don't know all the challenges. I suspect it'll be better than I think. Jesus walked into this with his eyes wide open. He knew many, many would reject him and turn away. I'm going to give James my name. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit more than any name can ever be given. And I'm not exactly sure how this ties in, but I felt like I needed to share it. James will be my son, whether he believes it or accepts it or walks in it or not. And we are. Accept it and walk in it. For it is good. For he gives good gifts. And he has given them to all of us. Let's pray. God, thank you that you have adopted us as sons and daughters in your family. You have given us your name. And you have paid the cost that we could not pay. That we can be with you. Both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. With gratitude, we raise our song to you. Come and fill the praises of your Shallow spring will ever satisfy us, but your river deep floods over everything. Take away our sickness and our sin. O Lamb of God, we gather at your table in bread and wine. You have supplied our Good morning. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and grab a seat. We'll get through these announcements.
All right. Uh, this month, several ministry partners are gathering to assemble and distribute gift bags to about 200 Afghan and Somali Muslim families. If you'd like to be involved in this outreach, the main need is for help with the delivery and for money to cover the costs of the outreach. The bags will be delivered on April 28th at 7 p.m. or on April 30th at 1 p.m. If you'd like to contribute financially, please give through the link on Facebook or contact Guy Pierce or David Kaufman with any questions. On Monday, April 18th, the women will meet at the Panera in Smyrna for dinner and fellowship. We have a new prayer request. Please pray for the Muslims in our community and around the world who are fasting during Ramadan, that God will reveal himself in truth and also that God's love will be shown clearly through the gift bag outreach at the end of Ramadan. We have some ongoing prayer requests. Let's just enter into a time of prayer before our Father. Father God, you are so good. You've given your only Son that we might have life and have it abundantly. And Lord, you hear every single prayer, the unspoken ones, the ones that are just so deep that we can't seem to even get the words out. Lord, you hear the prayers that are spoken through tears. You hear the prayers that are spoken through groanings. And Lord, you hear every single one of us. Father, we lift up Jim Fredrickson, Mary Lynn's dad, who's had several mini strokes but hasn't received a diagnosis for treatment. We lift up Alice Sabota. Ricky Knudsen's sister, who's undergoing several significant diabetes-related surgeries. Father, we lift up Charles Hendry, who's had spinal surgery this month to improve severe compression on nerves, affecting his ability to walk. We pray for his healing and for the family as they care for him. We pray for Debbie Williamson's dad, Michael Smithers, who's had several worrying symptoms, including headaches, dizziness, grimacing, double vision, staggering, and dropping things. He's waiting on an appointment with a neurologist. Lord, we pray for answers, and we pray for quick healing. For Carrie Hilpert's father, who's had a stroke recently, Lord, we lift him up and ask for healing. We lift up Frank and Laura Parker, Geneva's cousin, who lost their preemie quadru quadruplets. Lord, we pray for healing and peace. We pray for Aussie Green, a 19-year-old friend of Mary Birch who's fighting Hodgkin's lymphoma. Lord, we pray for her healing. For Rachel Schneider, a friend of the Birches who's been diagnosed with cancer in her thyroid and lymph nodes. Father, touch and heal. Dispel all the cancer. We pray for Ricky and Whitey's brother-in-law, Dan Molesky, who's undergoing radiation treatment for prostate cancer. Lord, we ask that you would touch and heal his body and give the doctors wisdom. We pray for Ruth Parker, who's having dialysis two times a week. We pray that her strength would return. And Lord, we pray for healing. For Joe Villanova's sister Maria as she's recovering at home from heart surgery. And for Lori, Karen Pierce's friend, as she goes through chemo for breast cancer and she recovers from surgery. Lord, we lift up Stephanie Taylor as she continues weekly chemo treatments. She has another two months of chemo before she's begin radiation treatments and her father has been diagnosed with advanced bladder cancer. Father, bring peace and healing into that situation. Dispel the darkness and the doubt. Lord, we lift up Jim Birch and Ellen Birch. We pray for Becca Jones. We pray for Shannon Mulvey as she continues her fight with breast cancer. We pray for Sharon and Derek to be rejuvenated daily, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. We pray for Song Kapajama as she continues to recover from her stroke. And for Kenny Chambers. Debbie Williamson's uncle who has kidney cancer and has had a stroke resulting in paralysis. Father, bring your Holy Spirit and healing into that situation. We pray for David Lee's sister Karen Clark in Houston who has 100% congestive heart failure and is only being kept alive by a pacemaker. Lord, we pray for a deeper and abiding peace with you and we pray for her family. We pray for Seth Averett who's in the Marines and Joseph Averett who is in the Air Force Lord, strengthen them, encourage them, help them to know that you are there in every situation. 
Help them to turn to you in, in everything. We pray for Steve Ford's mom, Karen, who has MS, and his dad, Rich, who's still recovering from neck surgery. And we pray for Lee Thomas, who's undergoing chemotherapy for stage four cancer. For Chad Mickles, Karen Murray's brother, who has degenerative arthritis and Parkinson's disease. For Cameron W. And David Lee's niece, Amy Cuellar, who's still struggling with myasthenia gravis, but also now has RSV. She's out of the hospital, but Lord, we continue to lift her up and ask that you would touch and heal. For Jennifer and Christopher Averett, adopting a child from Liberia. Lord, we pray for Kamsan and all the churches in Southeast Asia, for Hand of Hope Ministries in Ethiopia and Kenya, for Peniel Christian Fellowship Church in Isilio, Kenya, and New Hope International Missions in India. Father, we lift up Rich and Mary Lynn Ross at Springs of Life in Jellico, and Myra Lomax in Cambodia. We pray that she would have good work and home life balance, and that she will guard times with God and she'll continue to grow in her language skills, that she continues to put her trust in you to work in the relationships that she has at the gym, even if her time investment doesn't seem significant. Lord, we lift up the City Church Network and the Reynolds Tribe Experience. And for all the pastors and churches in our community, for Green Street Church, Arise Christian Fellowship, New Joy Fellowship, for Williamson Branch, for Dan Midget, and all of our elders, pastors, and ministers, especially today for Rich Ross as he ministers in Jellico. Father, we pray that you would fall on Jellico in a mighty way, that your Holy Spirit would blow through there in power, and that lives would be changed, that through Rich and Mary Lynn, Lord, that you would bring hope and healing into the lives of the men and the women who are there, that your name would be lifted high above every other name. Lord, be glorified in their midst. Show yourself strong on their behalf. And in this place today, Lord, draw us ever closer to your side and open our hearts and our minds to your word and to your Holy Spirit. Touch and heal those who are here who are in need of a touch of healing, Lord. And help us, Father, to lay aside every sin that would encumber us and to run freely in the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. You are awesome, Lord, and we love you. And we say all these things in the precious holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, God bless you. Take about five minutes and say hello to someone that you haven't seen in a while, and we'll begin our message shortly.
All right, everybody. If I could nudge you toward a seat of your choosing. It was worth a try, Ken. Oh, there we go. I don't know if Nick did that or if somebody just leaned against the wall in the back. But. This morning, uh, as, we, as we continue to celebrate together the resurrection of Jesus, um, part of what, what I'll do is just... Um, well, I think I'll just use the image that we were talking about when we went back to pray before starting. Share some streams of thought that have come to me in, in reading these passages this week and trust that the Holy Spirit will manage the navigation of those streams to merge the ones he wants merged or dam up ones if he wants to make a puddle somewhere or a pond. Um, but obviously... You know, it's so interesting. Um, the work of the Holy Spirit, well, I'll just use some of Jesus' descriptions. It's like the wind. You don't see the wind, but you can tell that the wind's blowing. You don't necessarily know what the wind is doing or what the wind has in mind, but you can see the leaves rustle as it goes past. I, I know partly... There's just an energy and an emotion when we all gather together, Wednesday and Sunday together. And then you throw in the extra, I don't know, 20 or 30 of you that have come from out of town or distant places or occasional visitors or whatever that are here this morning. And that adds another level of, of just joy, the joy of being together in the Holy Spirit. Um, and it is different. This is, um, sorry, y'all don't mind if I pick on you a little bit, but Seeing the Burgesses after, I don't know how long it's been since I've seen, I saw, saw Gideon a little bit at the trek and Daniel, but I haven't seen Lydia, I don't know, Abigail's wedding maybe? I don't know. So October. Um, that is different than me running into somebody from my high school that I haven't seen in six months. It's different from going to Walmart and encountering a coworker, even a coworker that I really liked, and there were a few. Um, if any of them are watching, it's a good thing, and it's the work of God. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll make whatever amends are necessary later. I, I'm not to that step yet in CR, so I've got a little, little bit of grace for the next few weeks. But there is a difference when I encounter somebody that's family. Um, and I don't mean biological family. I love my biological family. But I don't know how many generations back we'd have to go to find somewhere where we're related. But when the Burgesses walk into the room, my heart leaps. And I can say that about several of you who are here from a distance today. So there's, there is part of that that's just... It is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not necessarily a dramatic or unusual work of the Holy Spirit. There's a work of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ being together and sharing His presence with each other. So I know there's that layer that just runs through everything and that, and that adds, for me at least, more intensity and emotion. The last couple of weeks have been pretty emotional. Worship was really emotional. Thank you, guys. And, and I'll be honest, I said this to Christopher already. I saw that Christopher was getting up for communion, and I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to get a little bit of an emotional break. Christopher will have <laughs> some really solid thoughts. He will call us to the table, and, and, and... What would you, the, the th if, if it hits the threshold for Christopher to cry, then my threshold was passed, like <laughs> miles in the past, um, but so good. So just, I say all that to say, I believe the Holy Spirit will be at work in some of these streams and strands in what I want to share this morning. Don't be surprised if it's just one particular piece. Don't be surprised if there's a little two-minute slice out of this that's what the Holy Spirit wants to use to minister in your life. Now, maybe he'll take five or six things and weave them together and make this really big, pretty picture. That's great, too. 
But be attentive to what the Holy Spirit's doing in you as we encounter the Word of God this morning. So we're going to be in John 20 again. Um, and you can be flipping there if you want to. That's the passage that Brandon, le- or one of the two passages that Brandon led us in this morning as part of our call to worship. And I love the way, Brandon, that you called us into the story. I, I so much believe that that is a discipline that would help us in our intimacy with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit if we didn't read these as stories about something that happened to someone else but as stories that we are, in fact, part of. And don't get delusional. You're not actually Mary at the tomb, but you know what? You're Mary at the tomb. You're not actually in the crowd yelling, crucify, crucify. You know what? I'm sorry. Some of us were in the crowd yelling, crucify, crucify. At one point or another, all of us are. You're not actually anointing the body before preparing it for burial, but you know what? You're part of that story. It's one of the things that has blessed me in engaging the church calendar more over the years is it helps me enter into the story. So part of today is just going to be some snapshots from the story. Um, And I invite you to engage with those. The first thing that I want to actually mention, and and some of this probably comes because I've had the blessing of doing two now and retreats in the last month. So, and I'm just curious about how many of you, whether you've done it at a retreat or how many of you have read the book in the name of Jesus at this point? That's good. What's wrong with the rest of you? No, I'm just, <laughs> no the time will come when that's the right book for you to read and when God calls you into it. If, if you keep going on in his kingdom, that day will come, I think, because it'll come for most of us. That book has obviously really shaped and influenced us as a church. Um, thank you, Henry Nowen. Thank you, Nick for calling that book out for us. But for those of you who hadn't read the book yet, one of the things that, that Nowen says is that as leaders, in whatever sphere we're called to lead as Christians, that as leaders we are always tempted to be relevant, to be spectacular, and to be powerful. In other words, to do things that matter to other people, to do them in really impressive ways so that we get a lot of people's attention, and to do them in ways that gives us a chance to make other people do the things that we want them to do. And so this morning, um, actually not long before I, I came over here, I was thinking again about the passage this morning, and, and I realized what's not in the passage. What's not in any of the resurrection narratives. There are no witnesses. This is the most dramatic event in the entire history of the universe. The resurrection of Jesus is the fulcrum on which everything before and after hangs. If we were doing that, if, you know, and I mean, it's, I guess it's hard to imagine, but put yourself in the story a little bit. If God said, hey, Priest Lake, I got something really big coming on. I'm going to raise my son from the dead, and I want you to help me plan it. Okay, well, we got to upgrade the, the live feed stuff for sure, because we don't want to go to green screen in the middle of the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, We definitely need to integrate your followers and your Facebook channel so that we can pump it out to all them. All of you people who've got TikToks and Instagrams and Snapchats and whatevers, come with your phones ready because we want to capture this event, right? And we want to make sure to send it out all over the world. We need to make sure every elder's here to bear witness. We're bringing Rich and Mary Lynn back from Jellico. They need to be here for that too. Um, Phil, if you would call all the, the other pastors and get Dave Clayton over here and Kevin Queen and these other leaders, we want them to be able to bear witness with us because this needs to be well testified to and provable and verifiable and it needs to be a big stinking deal. The only people on the scene apparently were a couple guards who apparently were passed out. God doesn't need an audience. One of the reasons that came through my mind this morning is that I read, I shouldn't ever even look at Facebook before church on a Sunday morning. And I just looked at one thing. It was the wrong thing. Um, And I thought, and I immediately wanted to go into this place of, well, let me defend God in this. And then I thought, wait a second. Not my job. 
he, he hasn't asked me to do In fact, he defends me. I don't even need to defend me, much less him. And that just got me thinking about how differently God does things than we do. So the resurrection occurs, the new creation is inaugurated, and nobody's there to see it. Jesus just gets up, walks past some comatose guards, and goes. So that, that's the first note that hits for me this morning is, is what's not in the story. And just that reminder that often the incredible things that God does, He will do in ways that make no sense to us and that are not the ways we would do it. Say it again, Debbie. Most every time. <laughs> that's true. Read the book and see how many of those ideas you would have come up with. So with that said, with what's not in the story, let's look at what is in the story. Uh, we're going to read again from John 20, verses 1 through 18, and I'll invite you to stand with me as I read from the gospel this morning. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb we don't know where they put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out, heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter came also. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple, who'd reached the tomb first, then entered the tomb, saw and believed, for they still didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went home again. But Mary stood outside facing the tomb, crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the foot where Jesus' body had been lying. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them. And I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, although she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you've removed him, tell me where you've put him and I'll take him away. Jesus said, Mary, turning around, she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, for I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said to her. So, Father, we stand in that great chain of, of witnesses to what your resurrection means. Now, we haven't seen him with our eyes, but we've been told about it by those who were told about it, by those who were told about it, and we have experienced him in our lives. God, help us to continue to enter in to what you've done for us in the resurrection of Jesus. We praise you, and we pray in his name. Amen. All right, so be seated. I'm going to talk about Mary first. Um, isn't it interesting who God chooses and uses? And isn't it interesting who you would think he would choose and use that doesn't show up? Mary, at least as John tells the story, and some of the other gospels say there were some other women with her, but who's not with her? Peter? John? Andrew? For that matter, Nicodemus and Joseph, who helped with the burial and therefore presumably knew where the tomb was, Mary goes. She gets there and she sees the stone rolled away and she goes, she doesn't know what's going on. She goes looking for help. You know, it, it is so, again, put yourself in the story. She can't call them, guys. She can't just text them and say, hey, I'm here at the tomb. Do you know what's going on? She has to go find him. She goes and finds him. And we'll, we'll come back to Peter and John in a minute. They have the encounter with the tomb and they go on. But Mary, Mary stays. 
And Mary stays weeping. So here's one of the things that struck me this week. Thinking about the joy of the resurrection. But also thinking that the first one to find Jesus finds him in her tears. Folks, I think that's important. I think that's important. Peter and John come to the tomb and they go and do other things and they do Peter and John things and that's fine. Mary stays and cries. Thinking about last night, uh, about 20 or 25 of us gathered here for a service of lament, uh, which was good and you should come next year. That is the pathway to finding the resurrected Jesus. You know, I, I just at least speaking for myself and people I know, I don't know many people whose lives were going so well that it led them to Jesus. There probably are some. I mean, I know there have been people. Connie, I think your story is you pretty much have walked with God all your life. You never had the major falling apart. It's good for you. Good for him. And I'm, I'm all for aiming in that direction. I just, for most of us, that wasn't what brought us to our most significant encounters with the risen Jesus. Most often what's brought us there is our pain, our brokenness, our sorrow, our tears. Mary, in her tears, she has no idea where to go, so she just hangs around. You know what she doesn't do? She doesn't give up. She doesn't just pack it in. She stays. She sticks her head in. She sees, which this is interesting. According to John, who, who at least I think almost all of us would believe was the other disciple at the tomb, John, who stuck his head in, if he saw angels, he doesn't mention it. But he does mention that Mary saw the angels. I wonder if there's a reason why they showed up for her and not for him. I wonder if there's, maybe they were there and he missed them. But she's not looking for angels, is she? She's looking for Jesus. She's looking for a Jesus that she believes is dead. But she's still looking. And then she sees him. She doesn't, know it's, she doesn't know it's him. She tells him what she's looking for. They're taken away. My Lord, I don't, know, I don't know where to look. She turns around and sees him. She doesn't know it's him. Now, the, the resurrected body of Jesus has so many interesting things. At times, he appears to be totally recognizable. At times, he appears to be totally unrecognizable. I can't explain all that. I'm looking forward to getting to find out what that's like when we get one of those. And maybe she's just crying that hard. I mean, I can identify with that. She can't see who she's talking to. Tell me where you put him and I'll take him away. And then she recognizes him when he says nay. How many times, how many times has she heard Jesus say her name? I mean, we don't know, right? We don't know all their encounters. She seems to have been one of those women that was following him, helping him out with things for a significant period of his ministry. She didn't recognize his appearance, but she recognized the tone in his voice when he called her by name. And John doesn't tell us he gave, that she gave him a big hug at that point, but I think it's a reasonable implication from the text, right? Don't cling to me. I mean... It's kind of like when an angel says, fear not. Why does the angel say, fear not? Because the person is terrified. Why do you say to someone, please don't cling to me? Because she's thrown her arms around him and is holding on for dear life. Even more than she knows. And then, and, and I, I don't know that this is the first time Jesus uses this language this way. I didn't go back and look through every time he uses this language. But boy, it struck me this morning. Tell my brothers that I am ascending to my Father, expected. Okay, it's not the first time Jesus has referred to the Father as his Father. But it struck me this morning, he says, to my Father and your Father. He's now not just my God, he is also your God. Something, Mary, something shifted last night that you don't even understand all the implications of. But to go back to some of what Christopher was saying earlier, 
that adoption has taken place now. Now, there's more to come. The Holy Spirit's yet to be poured out. There's so much that, that Mary and all the disciples are going to be figuring out over the next several years as they learn what does it mean to be a part of this kingdom that God has called them into. But something has happened the night before. And God is now Mary's father. And Peter's father. And John's father. And I intended to go around the room calling names, but I won't be able to do it. So I'm just going to say, and your father. He is your father. Because of what happened Saturday night, Sunday morning. He is your father. Mary found him in tears. The other thing that struck me this week, and it struck me before, but something struck me again and again. So, so John and Peter are running to the tomb, right? And one gets there first, and then the other one goes in, and the other one comes in after him, and they still apparently don't see the angels. They do see the cloths, and they just they don't know what's going on. But verses 8 and 9 are really encouraging to me. John went in the tomb, saw and believed. And, this, and so John, who is writing this gospel, says, I believed and I still didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. That is so encouraging for me. What is it that John believes at this point? He believes that God has done something. He doesn't know what it is. But he's going to put his trust in that. He's going to trust the God, that the same God who sent this rabbi that might be Messiah, that the death that happened on Friday wasn't the end. I don't know yet what that means, John's saying. I don't know. I still don't understand. That's going to come a little bit later where the disciples get understanding of what that empty tomb means. But something about John's encounter with the empty tomb brings him to a place of trust in God who, without even knowing what that trust means. You know what? I can get on board with that. If I have to understand everything that my trust means, it, it's, there's a long road ahead. And brothers and sisters, most of us aren't going to make it to the end of that road. And by most, I really mean all. I mean, if, if, if your ability to trust God is contingent on your understanding everything God is doing, you're going to have a long wait. Now, I don't mean that God is totally unintelligible. There are things he does that make sense. There are things he says that make sense. He's gone to a lot of trouble to communicate with us. And so I think we can put some credence in those things that he's communicated with us. But you know what? They don't answer all the questions. They just don't. Even as we celebrate this morning with resurrection... And I am. Boy, my heart's full of joy this morning. And you know what? There are questions. There are questions. And I, I'm, you know, again, as I look around the room, I can look at some of your faces and I, can say, I know what some of the questions are. You can look at my face and you know what some of my questions are. Sorry, sorry Phil, but since you referenced it earlier, why, Nathan? Why? Why? I don't understand. It's been a year later. I still don't understand. I don't understand why that worked out that way. You know what I do? I trust that God was at work in that. I don't have to understand it. I'm probably not going to understand it. I don't understand why God heals sometimes and others he doesn't. I don't understand why sometimes couples in a marriage can turn to each other and the marriage can be restored and other times they can't. I don't know. I don't get it. But, or maybe instead of but, I should say and. And I believe the tomb is empty. And I believe that's the point from which I have to answer all these other questions. Does that make sense? Guys, this is the center of our faith. You know, we talk about there are things that are at the fringes and things that are important but not central, and then there's the core. This is like that triple bullseye area in the middle of the core. 
Okay, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. You know, some of you are saying the dead aren't raised, but I'm just going to tell you, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then our faith's a joke. It's not quite his language, but it's pretty close. There's no point being a Christian if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. Just find a nice way to live and live that way. But if, in fact, Jesus was raised from the dead, that becomes the central point from which I engage every other question. Because the thing that the death and resurrection of Jesus shows me, beyond all doubt, is that God loves me that much. And the fact is, He loves you that much. Now, and more. (laughs) Now, why does God let somebody He loves that much have periodic crushing pain? I don't know. I don't know. Why does he let somebody he loves that much turn and walk away? I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand, but I come back over and over again to this point. And this point says he loves me. And he may let things happen that I don't understand. I'm not saying he wants all those things to happen. I, again, I don't understand. I'm not smart enough to figure out all the sovereignty of God, free will, man's choice, consequences. I can't figure all that stuff out. There are people who think they can. Maybe Some of them are probably right. I don't know. I'm not that smart. I can stand here. I can stand with John. I can stand with John and I can stand with Mary. I can stand with John and I can say, I don't know what just happened, but I believe it. I don't know what just happened, but I know this man. I know this God. And I believe him. And I can also stand with Mary. And I can say, I'm in tears, but I'm not going anywhere till I find Jesus. I may hurt, I may weep, I may grieve, but until I see Jesus, I'm not leaving. And I don't make rules for God. I mean, I, well, that's not actually true. I do, but it's wrong. He doesn't pay much attention to them. Um, but I will say that my experience of God has been that when I do that, He shows up and meets me. Not always the way I want, not always the time I want, but He shows up and meets me. And He will show up and meet you. This is a, a, a probably an unusual way to end an Easter sermon, but here's what I want us to do as, as we wrap up the sermon time. Um, so this morning, Jamie and I, at about sunrise, read the whole chapter together, John 20, not just the first 18 verses, but, but John 20 ends with, these stories have been written down. You know, for, well, he comes to the disciples, then Thomas shows up, and Thomas says, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. Okay, here you go. And then John says, I wrote all these stories down. Jesus did a lot of other things, but I wrote these down so that you might believe. So, in the middle of our joyful celebration this morning, I want us to take about two minutes in silence, and I want us to intercede for those who have not yet seen and believed. And you can do that on your own. You can turn to a couple people next to you and do it. You can do it out loud you can do it silently you can do it under your breath i don't really care but for a couple minutes we have seen jesus and he has changed everything now let's take a couple minutes and bring to the father those who haven't yet seen him or maybe their eyes are so full of tears that they don't even realize that's what they're seeing but we'll do that for a couple minutes then i'll i'll close us
Father, we acknowledge together that the death and resurrection of Jesus is at the center of our lives. That that's where we find meaning and hope. That that's where we see you pouring out your love for us. That that's where we see how much you want us to be your children. And so, God, we also lift up those who don't see it yet. And we ask you, open their eyes. You know the best way to do it. It's not, not my job to tell you how to do your job. But we do ask you, would your kingdom come into more lives? Would your will be done in more sons and daughters? For your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. risen. And that changes everything. So for those of you who've been with us online, God bless you as you go into the rest of your celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. For those of us who are here, let's take another minute or two in silence. And and as